Hello, you're joining us on a brand new edition of Vantage Point and on this edition we will be talking about the highlight of the week, especially how um, the current governor of the central bank has been accorded with the title of best governor of South Asia while the former governor of the central bank is uh, going under harsh criticism for his work uh, during his uh, tenure. Well, to discuss that we have Dr. Dan Jatilaka here with us in the studio. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me over edition but every edition of Vantage Point we've uh, completely uh, focused our attention on the central bank bond auction and its inquiries of the presidential commission and now we are at a juncture but we've waited for almost eight months nine months and uh, we are anticipating the report and we're waiting for the report to come out this month but there's also um, a little bit of a um, delay of the report coming out, but we are also looking into the future as to what will happen next. What exactly is going to be the next step in the inquiry? Yes, when uh, the result, the verdict comes out, does that mean uh, the ones who should be prosecuted will be prosecuted? And will Prime Minister Rani Vikram Singh give a startling statement right at the end of the inquiry, uh, whether or not new witnesses will be coming out into the open? How exactly is this going to pan out? Well, first I have to congratulate TV1 because uh, its its coverage has been in, impeccable. I mean, frankly, uh, I listened to this. My wife, who's a British trained and uh, an economist, uh, an accountant who uh, worked in Britain for twenty years, tries to explain it to me every day, and I'm no good at understanding it. But when I watch TV1, <clears throat> then I understand what's been going on. Now, we are at a very crucial moment and that is uh, whether or not the term of office of the Commission of Inquiry will be extended. Right. Um, the, the grapevine says that the commissioners have asked for an extension of three four months. Yeah. I would think that, you know, at least until the end of the year, it, it's logical. Uh, but it is also said that uh, there is a lot of pressure uh, on the powers that be uh, not to grant that extension and to wrap things up. Mm. Now, your station was questioning why uh, the uh, leading of evidence was grinding or rather was brought to an abrupt yeah. halt or was due to be brought to an abrupt halt um, and why the two ministers weren't subject to extensive questioning. Mm. So whether or not the term of office will be extended will be very telling indeed. We'll know what's going on. Right now, Stephanie, I have to say, this is rather like uh, Hamlet without the Prince of Denmark. Mm. The Prince of Denmark in this case happens to be the Honorable Prime Minister because his name has come up several times in the commission. In fact, he had uh, written out a statement he, saying he that has, he's, he's said ready, he's, to, he's ready to, uh, to come before the commission. Right. Now, when the Prime Minister says he's ready, because his name has come up, um, it really would be an anticlimax were the Commission to put up its shutters without an appearance by the PM mm. and uh, without extensive questioning. Mm. Uh, it's good all around. It's good for the PM, it's good for the government, it's good for the country. Because, as we know from uh, similar proceedings in the United States of America, uh, the question is, where does the buck stop? Mm. Now, that's metaphorical in the United States, but it might be rather literal in this mm -hmm. case. So, we need to know where the buck stops. Mm. We need to know who made the decisions and why. The questions have already been raised by the AG's department uh, of Mr. Mahindran. Uh, 
Right. Uh, was it not the Prime Minister who uh, phoned you and appointed you and, and, and got you over from Singapore? Right. And Mr. Mahendran says uh, that he can't remember whether it was on a phone call, but it was, yes, it was the Prime Minister. Now, the questions remain. Why bring over somebody from Singapore where you do not have dual citizenship, therefore you have someone who is not a citizen of Sri Lanka and therefore is not accountable or less accountable and make him the head of the apex body of Sri Lanka's financial system. Then why is it that um, and how is it that he is living in the same under the same roof as a young gentleman who owns a company which turns out to be the beneficiary mm -hmm. and to whom uh, Mr. Mindon is related. So there is a, a, a whole chain here mm -hmm. um, and the PM finally has to answer mm. because he is the one who picked Mr. Mahindran and asked him right. to come over and take over this post. Well, well, shouldn't the PM be picked the moment that um, information about the EPF was revealed at the commission? Uh, they have said that about 550 million rupees of a loss was caused the EPF money for the public fund. Um, so who exactly should be questioned? Is it just the finance minister of that time or is it the minister in charge of economy itself who happens to be Well, the Stephanie, minister? there are two dimensions of this. One is the financial loss. The other is the moral question because when it comes to governance, governance rests on issues of public morality. I mean, if you... What does governments rest on finally? It's on legitimacy. Legitimacy derives from whether or not you have grossly violated that, that's ethical That's questionable. Norms. That's debatable, right? Morale, because it's it, what is right for one person can always be debated to be the well, wrong. But it has to be debated. Now, what, the, uh, and this is not something I'm saying, this is what Yasanta Kodagura, uh, the senior the Deputy Solicitor General said in writing, in reply to uh, the distinguished defense counsel, Mr. Ramesh De Silva, PC. Yasanta Kodagoda stated on the record that the losses to the country incurred as a result of this, these transactions uh, goes beyond anything that has happened in the history of this country and that uh, it, the losses are still ongoing. So, you have a huge financial and economic loss to the country at a time when we have been told that the previous government took loans and therefore we are in a, in a mess and, and therefore uh, we have to tighten our belts and pay higher taxes. Now, Which we are still doing. Which we are still doing. But if one is to go by Yasanta Kodagoda, the biggest loss incurred was not because of debt, but because of the bond scam. Now, this is not an, this is not Bandula Gunavodana. Hmm. This is Yasanta Kaudagada on right. the record, right. replying a senior lawyer. Right. So, you do have a huge uh, financial and economic question here. Uh, who drilled a hole in the boat? Well, who really drilled the hole in the boat? We'll talk about it after this short commercial break. Stay tuned. Well, just before the break, I asked the question, who really drilled the hole in the boat? But now we should shift our attention to the constitutional reform. Who is really drilling the boat there? And uh, what is really happening to the framework? We've been talking about it day in and day out. But we don't really seem like something, doesn't really seem like something is happening. There's some sort of stumbling block every time they talk about the constitutional reform. Where is this table turning towards? Well, we'll know after the big, or may I say mega, debate that's coming up for three days, three whole days. It's uh, going to be, uh, you know, Intense. very dramatic. Yeah. October 30, 31, November 1. Mark the dates. Um, so, we'll know which way this is headed. But right now, um, there seems to be a deadlock. 
there also seems to be some kind of rethinking on the part of intellectuals who supported the idea of a new constitution. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, let us start with the deadlock. There is um, an asymmetry of views between the two major partners in government and you can't have a new constitution if you do not agree on the road map where you are going. Mm -hmm. The UNP wants a new constitution and it wants to have a referendum because you can't have a new constitution without a referendum. Mm -hmm. Uh, Minister Lakshman Kiriala was the latest UNP spokesperson who said that. Uh, the Sri Lanka Freedom Party wing led by President Sirisena um, does not want a new constitution. It wants the president to stick, stick to his written uh, election pledge of January 2015 which was to have such constitutional changes such as will not require a referendum. Mm. So, in other words, that is not a new constitution. Mm. Because they are, is it because they are afraid of drumming up support at a grassroots level? Well, I think the SLFP um, has a better sense of what is happening in the villages mm. and it does not want to risk a referendum. That is one. But let us face it, they did say this in January 2015 that there will not be anything that requires a referendum. At that time, they could not have known about their popularity in 2017. Mm -hmm. So, it was a, a principal decision on the part of the SLFP. So, you have the two major parties of uh, a bipartisan government headed in two different directions. One saying, let us go the whole hog and the other saying, hey, hey, hey that is not what we promised. We do not want to go there. Uh, what we mm -hmm. want are amendments or reforms. Then you take the actual positions of the parties as contained in the interim report and the, the annexures uh, of, of the various parties, the party positions. Uh, there is a huge gap between the UNP position. The UNP has not produced a separate position paper, but the UNP has authored the interim report which was presented by the PM. So, the main report we may take as the UNP's position. Uh, the SLFP position and I mean the Sirisen SLFP position is uh, at variance so to speak with the UNP position. The UNP says uh, abolish the executive presidency, there are three options. Um, you can either have the Westminster model of a prime minister mm -hmm. or you have an elected pri uh, an executive prime minister or you have a president with less executive powers but elected by the parliament. Now, those are the three options mm -hmm. given. The SNFP says, hey, 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 hold on. If in fact you want to devolve more power to the provinces, then you cannot at the same time mm -hmm. weaken the executive presidency because you need the controls, the strong center. So, you can't weaken that central power by dismantling the executive presidency and then move forward on augmenting mm. the power of the provinces. It is mm. a contradiction. So, that that is a basic, it is like two architects, um, right. you know, trying to build something so, and one guy says, you know, let us do this and somebody else says, no. One mm. guy says, let us flatten this old building right. and, and build a well, new tower and the other one says, hey, hey, it is not that bad a building let us just add a new wing. So, yeah. I mean, how can you go forward? Uh, doctor, just help us understand what this constitutional reform is. Everyone is talking about it, but the only thing that keeps being highlighted and comes up as a sore thumb is uh, the president being reduced from his current powers and the prime minister being given more powers and there being a shift in the whole power structure. But what does it really mean for the public, for the minorities, for the people who are in need of more um, uh, introduction of more uh, charges for people who are doing the wrong thing, wrongdoers? Now, when you come to think of uh, rape and abuse, they say that the amount of criminal charges that's leveled against someone is not enough uh, according to the amount of uh, wrongdoings that are being done. So, you see a mismatch between the two. But we keep emphasizing on the power structure itself. But what does it mean for the public, for the people 
uh, who will benefit from this at the end of the day? Or is there any benefit for the people per se? Well, Stephanie, about criminality, that's uh, not really something that needs to be addressed by the Constitution. You can stiffen the laws. You can bring in, uh, you know, more penalties. Mm -hmm. uh, you can clean up the act. So that's more to do with the normal law and regulations. Right. Uh, so that can be done outside of the Constitution. The Constitution has to do with your architecture of the state. Right. Uh, it's to do with system and structure. So when you don't have one view, a coherent view, um, what can you do really? So I think this. I think there's a simple way out of this. Right. I'm not one of those who says, you know, they're messing everything up, there's nothing to be done. No, no. Right. All you have to do in any problem, Stephanie, is to think straight and be you know, fairly transparent and honest about it. Right. Um, let's say we have a discrepancy of views, but we still need to do the show. Right. What do we do? We take a little time out and we... Uh, set aside that which we disagree on and focus on what we are agreed upon. Right. And then we go into the, come into the studio and we do the show. So, there is obviously a disagreement between the SLFP which has led this country in the sense that there have been SLFP presidents for 25 years almost. 23, from 1994, from Chandrika, it's 2017. The UNP has done so for less. So why would the SLFP want to get rid of the executive presidency? Mm. They want to keep it. They're good at it. They've had people for 23 years. If not one, the other. All they have to do is switch loyalty. Mm. Uh, I mean, Chandrika to Mahinda, Mahinda to Sirisena, and they must be thinking, hey, we've got plenty guys we can run for presidential office, why do we need to get rid of this thing? Yeah. Uh, you know, we are not suicidal. The UNP doesn't have somebody who can win the presidency and that's why they want to abolish it. Why should right. we play their game? Okay, so you've got a deadlock there. Why don't you set that aside? It can already, there's already a compromise, that's the 19th Amendment. Right. Right. You set that aside and let's talk about what really is at stake and that is and that's exactly the north what south question right so the minority majority question let's not talk about the presidency at exactly. all exactly and that's exactly what's going to come up uh, at the end of this week in the end of this month but that's on the 30th 31st and the first do you think that I they will address hope so or because will it, there could be chaos yeah will will the topics just revolve around this one thing about the president and the president oh they'll the they'll, they'll revolve structure. Around, uh, everything they can revolve around and they'll do the unitary versus federal versus separation versus whatever then they'll do the presidency they, they'll they'll just have a lot of fun yelling at right. each other yeah. but this can be fixed this it can, can be, be fixed. fixed all it needs all that needs to happen is to say guys let's stop lying to each other and the public well right after this short commercial break we'll be talking about something very interesting enough uh, about the Iranian deal and how Donald Trump wants to pull the plug on it and what does it really mean for Asian countries like us because when the Iranian deal when there were uh, sanctions that were imposed on Iran we had to suspend uh, the importation of crude oil and other fuel and which really spiked our prices here in the country so this has an impact on us and we'll definitely talk about it after this short commercial break so stay tuned <laughs> Welcome back. You're watching Vantage Point, and we are in the final six minutes of the program. And we will be talking about the Iranian deal. Well, Obama, during his inauguration, right after his second term of inauguration, the first thing that he pledged is to mend ties with Iran and bring them back on track and give them the head start to really import, to um, uh, get their nuclear deal uh, suspended. And he did the same out any diplomatic channels between Iran and America, which was really hailed in the international arena as the biggest achievement ever by a president. But now Donald Trump, the newly elected president of the United States, has brought in a new uh, idea of how the Iranian deals should be suspended. And it, it was, the, in his own words, it was the most embarrassing deal of all time. 
and he even mentioned how the Obama administration failed at every level of striking a better deal with Iran. But this has its own consequences, not only for America, but for countries that are depending on America for aid, like us. We will be in a little bit of a mess if Trump goes ahead uh, without the consent of the Congress to pull the plug on it. And which means we will have to suspend crude oil, importation, other, other forms of oil. And this is definitely going to be a problem for Sri Lanka as well. Why do you think um, this has come about? Is it Trump trying to make a point? Is he trying to say that he is the best president of all time? Or is it one of his initiatives to really get people on track for real? Or is it just an attempt by him to show that he is better than all the other presidents? It's not Trump, it's the Israelis, it's Netanyahu. Uh, the Israelis have been trying to get the Americans on board for a strike on Iran because it sees Iran as increasing its influence mm, and as right. a strong power. I mean, right. it's former Persia, right? right. Um, it tried to convince Obama, but that did not work because, you know, Obama thinks rationally right. or thought rationally. So, uh, instead, Obama went in for diplomacy and very successful diplomacy it was too. Um, you had uh, the Security Council members um, plus uh, the the EU uh, engaging in the negotiations with the Iranians. And now, what's, hap what's happened is Trump's position is supported only by Israel and right. possibly by Saudi Arabia, but they haven't said it because they can't be seen to say it. Uh, the EU has given the United States a slap in the face and said, we are removing the sanctions because the Iranians are in complete compliance, they've been certified eight times by the IAEA. They're in total compliance. And you can't unilaterally undo something that's a Security Council deal. Mm. Um, now, the Americans within the United States, there's divided counsel. Uh, Rex Tillerson, the Secretary of State. Jim Mattis, Secretary of Defense. The U.S. military, mm. the U.S. military is saying, hey, hey, just that, like they said about North Korea, not so fast, not so fast. Right. Right. Uh, there isn't anything here that can't be fixed. L let's not go down that road. The Iranian president, who's a moderate, who beat the extremists, Hassan Rouhani, mad at Trump's speech that he came out within hours and made a very militant speech. You know, I, if I weren't watching it and listening to it, or rather if I weren't watching it, I would have Ahmadinejad, mm -hmm. because he was so mad, and obviously the, uh, the Iranian people are hopping mad, right. because they think they've right. been taken for a ride and you can't trust the United States. So what mm -hmm. might happen, I hope it doesn't happen, what might happen is that the Israelis might move on their own because they think they have Trump's support. Right. They might try to drag the Americans into some kind of confrontation with Iran. Already there's trouble in Iraq because the Kurdish people, uh, Iraqi Kurdistan, had a referendum uh, and it claims to, well, to have restored its sovereignty. But the Iraqi army has moved into Kurdish, where the oil fields are and taken over the oil fields and the government buildings. Together with Iraqi Shiite militia, mm. which are trained and advised by the Iranians. Right. Right. So, you might have the Israelis supporting the uh, Kurdish uh, regional government. You don't know. But whatever it is, it might affect the price of oil, which means it might affect the rest of the world and all of us included. Well, with that, uh, we'll wrap up this edition of Vantage Point. Remember, you can send us your views, your questions to newsfirst at maharaj.lk and this place is always open for it. Uh, until we meet again, stay tuned next fortnight. Good night.